part two, further analysis and discussion. In the book, you mentioned this problem of informational overload. And this is kind of similar to, you know, people's problem with a direct democracy. There's just the kind of too much I need to know and too much I need to do to be able to kind of address these issues. And similarly with this, right, there's too much I need to know. Mm. And maybe I've got to have it all in my head at once. And that's just, you know, it's unreasonable for any normal person to be able to uh, accomplish. Mm. So... I mean, how do you think we address that issue? Is it we just have to be kind of more mindful or something like this, or just kind of be more generally aware? It's it's a real challenge, and I don't have any um, any any great response to it. I'll be honest with you. Uh, now, I will say this though: here's a, here's a concrete way to navigate these waters. Mm -hmm. uh, if we're trying to become virtuous across the board, mm -hmm. uh, then this information overload problem is going to hit us in the face, uh, because there are many virtues. And with respect to each virtue, we're going to have to keep track of lots of information to try and become more like that particular virtue and more like that particular virtue. So I would say that's not perhaps the right way to go about it, trying yeah. to just hit the, hit the ball out of the park from the very beginning. <laughs> My preferred approach would be to say, let's focus on one or two areas of our moral lives. Let's kind of narrow our, our aspirations here and think about what areas where do I really struggle with the most? I might be doing pretty well and these areas, but you know, when it comes to my pride or my, um, you know, my self focus or something like that, mm -hmm. I, I need to make some more progress. And so compartmentalize it to one or two areas and then think of, you know, a handful of specific pieces of information or specific practices that I can implement in my life to try and mm -hmm. move the needle gradually over time. Because character change doesn't happen overnight. You can't flip a switch. You can't just, you know, snap your fingers and magically make yourself an honest person. You have to have the expectation that improvement is going to be measured on a month-to-month -month or year-to-year -year basis. Mm -hmm. And with that kind of, um, the kind of standard in mind, adopting a few strategies with a few pieces of information in the areas of our lives where we need it most, I think, is a way to make this much more practical. Good. I think um, when we interviewed Peter Singer, he he falls to a similar criticism, and there's just too much, too many things to consider in this ethical system that you can't possibly do it. And Daniel Dennett, as you said, you've listened to this one, he says something like, I reject consequentialism for this reason. You just can't predict and think about all this stuff in depth. But I like that response you've just given, because... Uh, my thought was when reading it that you just need to equip someone with the tools to start to recognize yeah. we can't really uh, uh, you're not asking people to get you think you know everything they can in the room i can't have in my in my mind's eye every object in this room now and how it might be influencing me but i certainly can start to think about oh i feel this this inclination to listen to this person or not speak up and why is that and by recognizing them, i think you can can overcome i on the back, uh, no, in the introduction, you say, this is not a self-help book or something right. like this. Um, and yes, your intention is certainly not. The, the aim of the drive is not a self-help book, but I had my head out the window, enjoyed the breeze and the, the, um, <laughs> the idea of it. It does, it is a self-help book in, in, indirectly because I don't know. I, I, I love the ethics episodes that we do because they, they, there's something very personal about them, something impactful and I try and live out and, and try and, um, live in accordance with the, the ethics books that we read for the show and you cue people to reflect upon their own experiences throughout the book i was thinking of the times and um for just one example um i was in london a f a f about two months ago and we're all in camden town had a few beers and we we're all getting on the subway and one of our friends was lost and we all got on the subway and left him behind in camden because a couple of the people in the group said oh, i'll catch up and I had this moment of, uh, and I conformed to the group and I felt so guilty oh, wow. for days afterwards because I thought I'm not, you know, I read so much philosophy and ethics and I've done this thing which is completely out of my character. And I told Greg a lie a few weeks ago and I, <laughs> I thought, and, um, I felt dreadful. Like, and, and I think perhaps what, what's happened is I don't feel as hard as my, on myself that sometimes you slip up on these, but just in terms of what the book teaches you um you mentioned students cheating and stuff i you know, remind my students now to about their responsibility not to cheat for an exam even when it's a small test or say to a student when i'm asking them a question be honest and that increases the likelihood that they'll be honest i think it's really useful like that but i think this is a really good approach because by recognizing these things in our environment we can overcome them 
And if we're not aware of them, how can we be expected not to be influenced by yeah. them? They're going to be subconscious. We need to make them conscious. Yep. So I really appreciate everything you said there, and I agree with what you said. When I said in the introduction that it's not a self-help book, I just wanted to make it clear um, that I'm not offering a 10-step formula. So there are a number of these books that are put out these days where, you know, uh, your guide to success in 10 easy steps. Um, and you just follow rules. these steps and, and then you've made it. Um, we're going to give you the magic formula or the recipe. And, um, you know, there, there it is all mapped out for you. Well, hmm. ethics is just, it's just hard. It's messy. It's complicated. There are no easy recipes or formulas or 10 step, um, checklists I need to go through that'll give me all the answers and make me into hmm. a virtuous person. So I just wanted to block that, uh, misinterpretation and hmm. signal to readers. I'm not doing anything like that. I, I I really like that, and I think uh, if I can encourage you to write a sequel already, to <laughs> perhaps talk about more of these experiments, and, and I think by reading the book or by listening to this podcast, it will certainly make the listener, the listener person listening to this now, look around you and think about what's influencing you now and in what you're doing, and, and next time you're in a situation, an ethical situation, or just a situation where you feel lazy, think why am I doing this, and you might be able to overcome it or something like that. So in the book, Christian, you talk about uh character traits and you say you kind of say well the important thing we want to look at is uh the dispositions a person has right these kind of things they have inside them that then lead to their actions uh, but and when i was reading and you kind of and you kind of say what we're concerned with is kind of what's in people's hearts this is a nice way to sum that idea up but i kind of part of me was worried about this and i kind of thought maybe some problems of taking dispositions to be the kind of um, exemplars of character traits, for instance. So rather than people's actions. So firstly, well, how do we know that people have these dispositions, right? We have to observe their actions. It seems like actions are kind of epistemically prior. So we find out about those first. And it seems like they're kind of, I don't know what the phrase may be, like metaphysically prior, or analytically prior, or something like that, because we define them in terms of what, people do um so that was the first kind of part of the question and then the second part was well maybe here's an analogy that you know people talk about in the metaphysics of dispositions consider salt yeah salt has the disposition to dissolve in water but now we imagine a world with no so uh, with no water whatsoever now we can ask the question well does the salt have the disposition to dissolve in water still so we kind of there's kind of a muddy area there and I, I kind of thought the analogy here might be, well, when you give the example of someone being cruel to a dog when they're on their own, um, if we're kind of going, well, this person could really be cruel in their heart, but we've never seen them mm. be cruel to a dog and we've never seen them be cruel to anyone else. Do we not have this kind of tension there if we're kind of looking at people's hearts and not just judging their actions? Great. I know that was a long question. Sorry, yeah. it was a bit. No, there's a lot, lot to say there and it was a great question. Uh, I don't get into these debates uh, very much at all in this particular book. Mm. In my previous research in moral character and also in character and moral psychology, mm -hmm. I, I get into it quite a bit. So I commend uh, that discussion to people who want to pursue it more. Uh, some some initial thoughts, though. Uh, you're quite right about the difference between the epistemic issue and the metaphysical issue. Uh -huh. So metaphysically speaking, I think of character traits as dispositions and they are prior to the thoughts and ultimately the actions uh -huh. that those dispositions give rise to. That epistemic question about our knowledge, though, goes in the other direction. Yeah. So we go from the actions, the observed behavior, uh, we go from that information to an inference about what the underlying disposition is like. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, in fact, what I do in much of this book, is I look at the psychological research, and I kind of see what's the overall picture of behavior that the psychological research is telling me. Is this mm -hmm. the picture of behavior that I would expect of a compassionate person or an honest person, mm -hmm. for instance, people who had those kind of psychological dispositions? Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I infer, so epistemically speaking here now, I mm -hmm. infer from the observed behavior to the metaphysical conclusion that most people do not in fact possess these virtuous dispositions. Yeah. Now, this is a, a fallible process, for sure. Uh, it's fraught with perils. 
I could be making uh, bad inferences, or maybe I don't have enough uh, ev uh, evidence to rely upon to make that uh, epistemic judgment. But there's still, I think, objectively, a truth of the matter. Yeah. Metaphysically speaking, either people have virtuous dispositions or don't, don't, or you in particular have the virtuous disposition of honesty or you don't, or you have the opposite vice of dishonesty or you don't. And so there's that objective truth of the matter, then there's uh, how we can discern what it is. Mm -hmm. Now, on the on the question of what dispositions are like in general, and the, the, the analogy with water and so forth and salts, I think we can construct examples where we can imagine someone having a character, but not an opportunity to exhibit that character for quite some time. Yeah. So we can have desert island examples, for instance. Yeah. Uh, where, you know, look, um, someone is, uh, has the, the trait of dishonesty, but is on a desert island and has no opportunity to cheat others mm -hmm. or lie to others. And maybe they can do it to themselves, but let's leave that aside for the moment. Uh, yeah. And so they can't it, it kind of act that disposition out in the world, but nevertheless, it's true counterfactually that if they were to get off uh, that island yeah. and be placed in an opportunity where they could cheat, they would mm -hmm. indeed cheat in virtue mm -hmm. of being dishonest. Mm -hmm. So I think they're true counterfactual statements about that person's character, even though, as mm -hmm. a matter of fact, there might be months or years that go by where they never have a concrete instance to exhibit mm -hmm. that disposition. Mm -hmm. That's an excellent response. Um, so you mentioned the problem of how much uh, in chapter one and chapter three. Um, and I guess in in relation to how much someone should practice the virtues, a uh, quotation from me here from page 75, we should expect the life of a compassionate person to show a pattern of helping to address at least obvious and relatively minor needs. And as a footnote, you add, um, so at the end of the chapter, quoting from your footnote on page 80. If you are looking for some guidance in the form of a principle or checklist to tell you how much you need to donate to charity or help others in order to count as compassionate, I'm afraid I don't have any such specific guidance to offer in this book. In fact, I'm not even sure we can come up with a, such a checklist in the first place. I thought listeners would be interested after our Singer interview where he's kind of, people have tried to uh, fledge this reductio ad absurdum against Singer, the idea that his theory leads to impractical results or impractical conclusion. Because if you really did spend every moment of your life trying to be compassionate or uh, maximizing happiness, then it, it doesn't work. Um, it's just, it's, it's an absurd conclusion. So to what extent, or do you want us to be, I know it's a, you've already said in the footnote there that you can't give the guidance, but can you give us any more that, more than that than, than what you've said in the book? Yeah, so, there I was also trying to be strategic. Uh, I didn't want, just like I didn't want to engage in a discussion in metaethics about the foundations mm. of morality and get bogged in that kind of, down in that kind of debate. I also here didn't want to get bogged down in a debate in normative ethics or ethical theory and mm. go through the different theories like Kantianism and utilitarianism and virtue ethics and see what they would say about the requirements of compassion and so have to contrast Singer's approach with, say, Kant's approach. Uh, that's just, just too much to do. Now, I am saying more than that, though. It, was, it wasn't just strategic. I am making the claim that I personally do not think that there is any kind of uh, straightforward algorithm or principle that we can use to decide in a given instance, should I be compassionate here or not? Yeah. Um, so this is me being taking a stand on utilitarianism mm. and saying that, like, at least kind of crude, uh, like, preliminary forms of utilitarianism, not more complicated ones like rule utilitarianism or indirect utilitarianism, mm -hmm. but just like the, the standard preliminary one, I think they're implausible. Yeah. It's me taking a stand on Kantian ethics and saying the attempts to work out a decision procedure using the first formulation of the categorical imperative or trying to get real practical guidance from the second formula, formulation of the categorical imperative are not promising. Mm -hmm. So I am doing that. Uh, taking that kind of negative stand. But I don't, mm -hmm. in replacing those views, have something positive to offer uh, as a really practical guide. So I say, look, if it's a situation where there's an obvious need and there would be little involved in helping someone, so drop papers or a bag that's leaking shopping goods uh, and there's nothing else that's involved in, in, in helping, you're not rushing off to a more important meeting or anything, it's obvious what you should do. Uh, in a case like Milgram 
or the um, the bystander effect where there's an emergency going on or you have the chance to shock someone to death, it's pretty obvious what you should do. Uh, if it's something less clear, like I've already made a certain number of donations to charity, I have now a ch an opportunity to donate to a new charity, mm -hmm. I have the money available, I can also use the money for other things instead, what should I do? I don't have uh, an easy checklist or principle or algorithm that mm -hmm. will give you the answer. It's more, and this is more the kind of virtue ethics or the Aristotelian uh, idea coming forward. It's more a matter of um, each person in their particular situation, given what's going on in their lives, mm -hmm. uh, discerning what the most important considerations are. Um, I don't, I'm skeptical of there being a simple rule that's going to be action guiding for everyone. It has to be very much a contextual, not re relative, not relativistic, but a contextual matter using practical wisdom to discern what the right thing to do is. You mentioned the Milgram experiments earlier, Christian, and, uh, you know, they seem quite powerful ones. And especially because, you know, we, we seem to be doing these kind of harmful or aggressive things. And then from that, we kind of go, oh, well, look, we have these kind of dispositions within us to do these harmful or aggressive things. But one of the questions that, you know, kind of arose to me is, well, how do we make the the kind of the jump from the kind of specific scenarios of these people to kind of, um, as you say in the book, um, most people living now in uh, kind of Anglo-American or uh, European cultures, so to use kind of philosophy lingo, how do we get from the kind of kind of limited existential quantifier to the kind of bigger kind of more universal quantifier from Absolutely. these people in this scenario to all people in all scenarios have this disposition does Good. that make sense it makes makes perfect sense it's okay, a great cool. question and you're thank you pinning me down on something that you're quite right to pin me down on uh if i'm being kind of over the top to make the the claims sound really interesting and exciting i'll say things like most people don't have the virtues period. Mm -hmm. But that's way too crude and is not at all warranted by the evidence that I uh, then use to support that claim. Um, if you want, so let's just try and refine it some more. What can I get away with claiming? What I, can I not get away with claiming? Uh, first of all, I'm using psychological research. Mm -hmm. So I better not make claims about people who existed before the psychological research was even done. Yeah. So I can't make claims about people a thousand years ago or even a hundred years ago when we didn't have these studies. Similarly, the research tends to be congregated in Western populations. Mm -hmm. So it's done mainly in North America and Europe. So I better be very careful about extrapolating from those populations to people worldwide, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we can narrow the scope down. Uh, having said that, if you have and one final qualification, I better be very mm -hmm. careful about not making any grandiose conclusions from one or just a couple studies, right? Mm -hmm. So I shouldn't go from Milgram to the conclusion that most people are not compassionate. That's, that's way overreaching. You can't infer mm -hmm. a big conclusion from one study. My attempt, though, to um, navigate these waters is the following. Let's look at hundreds and hundreds of studies collectively, mm -hmm. try and get the best ones we can over the past 50 years in psychological research, not relying on any one specific study, but looking mm -hmm. at the picture that they paint together, especially if some of them fail to replicate, which is a big question these days in psychology is a replication yeah. crisis going on. So we don't want to lean on too much on one. And then what does that picture look like? And that will also get a, give us a lot more participants too. So any one given study might only have 100 participants or 200 participants, but when we look at dozens and dozens and hundreds and hundreds, now we've got a bigger participant pool to draw on. And my hope is that if there's a consistent picture that's being painted, mm -hmm. not one where it's contradicted, you know, contradictory messages and we're getting uh, kind of messy data, but a consistent picture, I think there is, mm -hmm. then we can start drawing inferences about what most people's character looks like. And when we do that, we're using lots and lots of participants and we, so we can kind of take into account lots of differences between those participants in the process. So we have differences of male, female, we have differences of social economic status, that those have to be factored in as well. But we have experimental groups, and we have control groups, the control mm -hmm. groups are going to have men and women, 
the experimental groups are going to have men and women. The mm -hmm. control groups are going to have students. The experimental groups are going to have students. The control groups are going to have some poor people and rich people. And so are the experimental groups too. So those differences are factored in as well. And yet, if we still see some broad patterns that emerge mm -hmm. of lack of helping, of cheating, of empathy being linked to helping, mm -hmm. then I think we can be justified in making some conclusions about what most contemporary Western people's characters seem to be like. So a round of concluding remarks just before we finish up. It's very, very rare that, given the, the philosophy that I read, that I recommend a book to, to my friends and family who are non-philosophers. And I've already passed this on um, to, to my brother and my sister and recommended it to students at school. I have a student who wants to do something that bridges psychology and philosophy who asked me yesterday, and I said, I've just read this perfect book, and you can look at perhaps uh, the character traits of people at the school. Um Genuinely, I'm not just saying this, Christian. It is one of my favorite books that I've read this year, and I, I do recommend it to all of our listeners. A link in the iTunes description, and we're going to give away some free copies on our, our Twitter page as well. So do check over there if you're listening to this now. Um, I think it's the the engaging examples that you give. I mean, Tiger Woods doesn't get a very good ride. Uh, Frank doesn't exactly have a smooth ride, and and Kevin Bacon's film Hollow Man, I think, uh, ends up in the urinal next to the next to the fly. Um, <laughs> But I think it is, it is in many ways, uh, I think, a, a, an enriching book for the self in, in development of one's own character. Um, it's learned me not to trust my students, that, that's for sure, um, given that I think you say, given this, these statistics, around a third of everyone something says in a working week is, is a lie and, and yikes at the end. And I, my annotation next to it was yikes as well. It, it's, <laughs> there's some shocking things in there and it's, it's definitely worth, worth reading. Um, on a serious note, not, not only is it a great work of accessible moral philosophy, it, it genuinely will uh, change people's lives, and hopefully it will, given the more research you, you say needs to be done, um, hopefully we can bridge that character gap as much as we can. I think we can all agree in, in saying that. Well, you might disagree with me here, Greg. What are, you, what are your concluding remarks? Um, my concluding remarks? I think, yeah, like I agree. It was really, in, in really compelling and interesting read. I thought it was a great example of one of the principal ways in which you recommend bridging the gap, namely getting the word out, right? You know, it's the prime example of let's find, if we know more about these sorts of effects on ourselves, mm. we will act differently and we will act in a more virtuous manner. And as you say in the book, we can develop all the strategies we want and package them in fancy workbooks, fun self-help guides and free podcasts. <laughs> and then I guess, I guess we can say this is precisely that. We're getting the word out further. <laughs> And I think it's true. Like, see, so you mentioned the example of the uh, bystander effect. And once people realize this, they, they actually, you know, bypass the effect and start to, um, help out more when people are in trouble. So, um, you know, it's a great read. And I, uh, anticipate the next time I am in one of these scenarios and I can reflect back on what I've learned and then, uh, employ my new knowledge and help people. <laughs> I first want to say thank you so much for having me on. Uh, You've really done a tremendous job in researching this interview. Uh, I mean, the, the amount of work you put into this is, is really impressive. And I also want to thank you for helping to get the word out, too. So this, I think, is, 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 can be a really important um, source of good uh, in trying to, to uh, help others learn about this research and ultimately to become better people. So uh, thank you so much for your time. Pop, 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 Philosophy quiz. So we're playing Stanley Miller Miller Milgram. So we've got Stanley Milgram, the famous social psychologist, best known for his controversial experiments on obedience in the 1960s. And we've got Christian Miller and Gregory Miller as well. And uh, so it's Stanley Miller Miller Milgram. Uh, so it's the Milgram experiment. So I've hooked Greg and Christian up to electric, uh, up to some power source. And for every question you get, Oh, I can't do that. I'm not allowed to do that, apparently. So for every question you get right, you get a point. And uh, if you get it wrong, you get minus a point. So buzz in, um, both of you. Just shout out the answer, and one of you will get the point for the correct answer, okay? Okay. So okay. I'm going to give you facts about uh, Stanley Milgram, and you've got to tell me whether they're true or false. Okay. Stanley Milgram died from a heart attack. True. False. 
False. Oh, it's true. <laughs> it's true. Well done, Greg. That's uh, that's one nil to Greg. Um, Stanley Milgram was Jewish. True. true. Oh, it's true, but Greg just pipped you to it there. Uh, Greg doesn't have the answers in front of him, by the way. This is, this is secret until, until the last minute. Uh, it's a two nil to Greg. We'll, we'll play first, first of four, maybe. Um, the following is a quotation from Stanley Milgram. The power of prayer is still the greatest ever known in this endless eternal universe. False. False. Well done. It was Stan Lee. The, uh, the chief of Marvel comics rather than Stanley Milgram. <laughs> That's 2-1. Um, what, which, which one should I do here? Um, <laughs> throughout much of Stanley Milgram's adult life, he occupied a home with his wife, Alexandra Milgram, two children, Michelle and Mark, and four cats, Smokey, Misty, Kane, and Abel. True. False. Oh, it's false, unfortunately. <laughs> I tried to trick you there to let you, you know did. who's you Jewish. And then... I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, to be one, to be united is a great thing, but to respect their right to be different is maybe even greater. That's a quote from Stanley Milgram. True or false? True. That uh, was Bono, the front man oh. of the band U2. Oh. I'm doing terrible. <laughs> and <laughs> finally... Um, Failure. I have learned to seek my happiness by limiting my desires rather than attempting to satisfy them. False. False. That was, do you know who that was? It's not Bono again, is it? It's not Bono again. That was, that was John Stuart Mill. Ah, good. <laughs> there we go. Well. <laughs> Wonderful. Right. Uh, thank you for listening to this episode of the Pansy Cast. If you want to support the show, please go to patreon.com forward slash Pansy Cast. Again, we want to encourage listeners, if you've been influenced by this ethics episode, go to thepansycast.com forward slash charity and consider giving to an effective charity through the life you can save. Links to all of Christian B. Miller's work can be found on our website and a link to his new book, The Character Gap, How Good Are We?, can be found in the iTunes description. As we've mentioned already, this is a really highly recommended book from us. We've really enjoyed reading it and we're trying to get the word out. We're giving away copies on Twitter as well, so head over there if you'd like to win a copy of the book. Thank you. You've been listening to the wonderful soothing voices of Mr. Gregory Miller. Thanks for listening and Professor of Philosophy Christian B. Miller. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Superb. Yeah, that was good. That was really good. Thank you, Christian. Wow. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. Um, I, I was serious when I said you, I mean, you guys really are impressive. Thank you. I-